All right, so thank you everyone for uh, uh, being here today. I'm delighted to be here in London and just uh, uh, present you the recent research uh, advances we have at uh, uh, IHK Research, uh, in particular focusing on Ouroboros uh, protocol, which is the backbone of Cardano. So plan of the day uh, is to go over all the important uh, research streams we have, which cover the design of the protocol itself, stake pools, incentives, sidechains, and uh, many more. So there's a lot of stuff to pack in one hour, so I'm going to press ahead. Uh, just uh, a little bit for, as an attention to the introduction, I'm Angelos Kayas at the University of Edinburgh, Chief Scientist at Input Output. And uh, a lot of the work that you see here has been done with uh, a lot of uh, great researchers at IOHK and also university pa uh, partners. Some of them are at the Blockchain Technology Laboratory, which is uh, a technology laboratory at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, others are in universities uh, uh, in Europe and the US. So I'll just mention by name, Christian Badertzer, Lars Burns, Duncan Kutz, Peter Gazi, Alex Russell, Bernardo Davies, Elias Kutupias, Romario Lunukov, Vasily Zikas, Katerina Stuka, and Dionysi Zendros. All right, let's see if this is going to work. So here's the talk plan. Um, so first I'll start with uh, what is the overarching goal that we try to achieve in this type of research, which is to build robust transaction ledgers. I'll give some background on proof of stake, and then I'll go a little bit into more detail in how the Ouroboros protocol works. Uh, then we're going to see how stake pools can be forged in that systems, what is the incentive structure of the protocol, and then I'll cover site change. So first step, robust transaction ledgers. So a robust transaction ledger is the problem that the Bitcoin protocol solves. Now, it's very important in computer science in general, when you try to develop a new algorithm or a new protocol, you have to understand what is the problem you're trying to solve. So a lot of the initial research on my side, also <coughs> together with people that we collaborated on, was to understand what is the problem that we're trying to solve. So the early years of this research led to a number of papers trying to describe precisely what is the formal definition of a robust transaction ledger. So this was joint work, which was, uh, we published actually initially in 2014, then it was appeared formally in the Proceedings of Eurocrypt 2015, uh, now referred to as the GKL paper or the Backbone paper. This was joint work with Juan Garay and Nikos Leonardos. That's the link of the paper. And there was a lot of follow-up work that refined this model and the definition. So I'll just mention work I did with my PhD student, Yorgos Panagiotakos, where we defined additional properties. Uh, work done by Passim and Enchella, who studied partial synchrony in the same setting, and more recently work by Baderter, Maurer, Trudy, and Zikas, where studied simulation-based definitions for that. So all that boiled down to a body of literature that now describes well what is the problem to be solved. Now, this is very useful, and I have to say, this is not about proof of stake. This is primarily serves as a formal definition of what we are trying to solve. Also, it is a yardstick that could be used by anyone else that tries to solve the same problem. There is a formal framework and definitions that they can use to demonstrate that indeed their problems are solving the same problem. So this is another very important aspect that we advocate. It is very important to have formal definitions to describe precisely what is what we are trying to solve. Um, so this work gave rise to two basic properties um, called persistence and liveness, which capture the two aspects uh, that you would expect from a robust transaction ledger. 
persistence asks for the fact that the ledger where transactions are recorded are immutable, is immutable, and transactions therefore persist. And liveness says that new transactions are incorporated in the ledger. So honest parties, if they participate, they will see their transactions uh, incorporated in the immutable ledger. So these are the two fundamental properties that you would expect from a robust transaction ledger. And you should be able to get those properties despite the fact that some of the parties may want to operate in a way so that these properties are violated. For instance, some transactions are removed from the ledger, that would be a double spending attack, or some transactions that are posted never appear, that would be like censorship. So, realizing the ledger was, as expected, satisfied by Bitcoin. Nevertheless, in retrospect, if you cast this in the wider body of literature uh, that is known to computer scientists about this problem, it was rather unexpected. So consensus actually, as a problem, was never considered in this setting. And some people actually may have even dismissed it as impossible. It's not possible to solve it in this setting, assuming mere honest majority. I'm not going into more details here about this. Uh, these are of interest to people that study the theory of distributed systems. Um, but what's important here is that Bitcoin as a solution was early on recognized to have significant scalability and efficiency disadvantages. So the natural question that arises here is, is it possible to realize the protocol in a more efficient way without compromising its basic assumptions? And, and here, like wh what's important is exactly this type of definitions that I showed you before. Once you have the definitions, once you know what you want to achieve, you can throw away the protocol and start from scratch. Clean slate. Is it possible to come up with a different protocol? Perhaps a different protocol altogether that actually solves the same question. And many people have thought about that. Um, and one important uh, type of solution that emerged, um, it was the proof of stake one. So, this brings me to some background on POS. Well, certainly POS would be the central of this talk. So, generating the next block in Bitcoin is a little bit like an election. Um, it's essentially a randomized process that is going to elect one uh, particular uh, participant to issue the next block. Now, there is a wide body of literature in what computer scientists call leader election protocols. Um, but uh, Bitcoin solves this in, a, in its own unique way. So something that happens is that there are these parties that engage in the protocol, they try to solve a cryptographic puzzle, and they are elected with probability proportional to its hashing power. So what happens in proof of stake is uh, in some sense a parallel to this process. So instead of having hashing power, as if you want the main uh, the main way that you participate in this process, in this lottery, if you like to call it, uh, in this way, uh, you substitute hashing power with stake. And now stake is the virtual resource uh, that is recorded in the ledger itself. So instead of miners now, you have stakeholders, which are identified in the ledger, and then there is a randomized process that uh, is going to elect the next miner to produce the block based on weights according to the stake that each of the participants has recorded in the ledger. So the protocol becomes somehow a bit more self-referential. Like the ledger itself determines what are the weights and the steps that have to be undertaken in order to produce the next uh, block. So a number of approaches have appeared uh, in the literature uh, or proposed as part of systems. I'll just mention uh, a few, but it's important to categorize them in two broad, uh, two broad groups. One of them is, uh, you can call it essentially a proof of stake blockchain, which means that the protocol uses a hash chain and some type of longest chain rule. So 
This means that the protocol, in some, to some degree, um, mimics the Bitcoin blockchain protocol, nevertheless removes the proof-of-work component and has a proof-of-stake component. The other class of protocols is upgrading uh, results from classical business in fault tolerant protocols and brings them to the POS setting. So there are many protocols that have been proposed uh, uh, in these categories. Uh, some of them are actually drawing ideas from both of them. So the categorization I'm doing is, is let's say, uh, first principles. Um, now, going back in history in the discussion of this problem, there is a folklore uh, in uh, people that follow the Bitcoin space that it's impossible uh, to write a, this, a robust transaction ledger protocol uh, following the logic that is in the Bitcoin setting. There are many reasons for that. Is the first one called costless simulation, and the other is long-range attacks. So costless simulation refers to the fact that there are no physical resources that are used in producing uh, blocks. So it is possible for someone that operates the protocol to invest, quote-unquote, in every possible alternative history or every possible execution of the protocol. Assuming, of course, that those are not exponentially many. But in principle, they can invest in multiple one of them. Um, and this will effectively incur no cost. The distinction here, based on cost, is the fact that in Bitcoin, when you are extending one particular version of history, you have to commit to it because you effectively take it and hash it into the proof-of-work instance you are trying to solve now. So once you find the proof-of-work instance, that proof-of-work instance carries inside it the history of the protocol that you have committed to. So when you transmit it, you are effectively also transmitting the history that you committed on. Um, so, of course, you do not have to commit to one of them. Uh, you can say, okay, I'm going to try to commit to, let's say, two alternative histories. But that means, because you have to do this hashing of the history and then attempt to solve proof of work, that if you have some mining equipment, you have to spend a certain percentage of that extending one history and another, the remaining, let's say, uh, the remaining extending uh, the other version of history. That would not be the case here. The virtual resource you have appears valid in both versions of history and in some sense is, is doubled. So you could potentially indistinguishably follow version of history A and version of history B, then find out which one, let's say, is the most agreeable to you Let's say maybe you get more rewards uh, in one version of history compared to another, and then publish this one. So this is a fundamental difference, and there is nothing that can be done to change that. This is exactly the nature of a POS, um, of a POS protocol. So any POS protocol will have this will enable such nothing at stake type of behavior. Um, the question, though, is, even though this is a problem, is this uh, something that kills the whole approach? Or is it possible to mitigate this type of behavior with a clever protocol design? So that was one problem. So another problem that was identified uh, is what's called long-range attack. Now, in a long-range attack, what happens is that imagine you are a node that you are joining the network at some point, let's say way after the network has started. And you are confronted with a certain history or perhaps you have a few alternatives. The protocol should enable you to choose the right history and what is right now by definition, would be the one that is followed by the majority of participants in the system. 
Of course, you cannot exclude like small splinter groups to follow any history they want. But the point is that a newly joining node should be able to find the protocol history that corresponds to the majority. And the bootstrapping problem, which is associated with that, is, uh, is, a, is exactly this question. Is it possible for a new node to bootstrap the protocol without having any uh, assistance or prior knowledge about what's going on in the network? Now, this is particularly important because uh, you don't want nodes, that, let's say, that go offline to have to use a um, trusted party to help them become initialized to the right uh, to the right history. Um, so, just to put a picture on that, here is the new party which joins the protocol. He tries to distinguish between two histories, and here is like what happens in proof of work. So, what happens in proof of work is that the adversarial version would be substantially shorter, uh, counting difficulty as length. So, what happens in uh, essentially the proof of work setting, it's possible for a new party to uh, figure out the right history because it's the one that's going to have the most accumulated difficulty. So that's a unique characteristic or a unique characteristic that comes with proof of work exactly because you count the amount of work that has been invested to a particular history. So this problem is resolved and now you can categorize all these issues to something that we call dynamic availability. So a dynamic availability setting is an environment where parties join and live at will. The number of online and offline parties dynamically change over time, loose clock synchronization, network connection, and the protocol does not have any a priori knowledge of participation level. So it does not know, let's say, that at time X there are that many parties active. So all these um, characteristics are the hallmarks of how Bitcoin works and what uh, uh, actually we would like is to solve this question. Essentially, design a pure proof of stake question that operates in the dynamic availability setting so the protocol has persistence and liveness as long as the adversary is the minority of stake. And furthermore, make an argument that as the protocol, uh, following the protocol as prescribed, is aligned with the parties' incentives. So, this is a question that we try to address with the Ouroboros uh, uh, research. Now I'll just make a uh, very, very quick overview uh, of how Roboros Proof of Stake works. So Roboros was presented in uh, Crypto 17. Um, it was the first provably secure POS blockchain. So there were many Proof of Stake protocols proposed before Roboros. Um, what was unique about this protocol is that we didn't set out to design a protocol, a, block, a POS blockchain protocol. We set out to develop a POS blockchain protocol together with the proof that the protocol met the objective of realizing a robust transaction ledger. So the proof of security and the protocol itself were two goals pursued in tandem, together. It was not that the protocol was proposed and then we tried to find a proof. The proof arguments and the protocol itself were developed together, exactly with the intention of being able to present an argument that the protocol can actually be uh, a convincing substitute of uh, a POW blockchain protocol. So, um, there were a number of open questions that left from this research. So that was an initial version um, of uh, our POS blockchain research. Um, a number of things that uh, were left as open was first that the protocol employed a random beacon generator that was based on publicly verifiable secret sharing. This came with a substantial uh, performance penalty and also the type of security is something that uh, in crypto cryptography and security literature is called semi-adaptive. Now this term basically uh, refers to what is allowed 
to an adversary when he tries to subvert the protocol? Is the adversary is allowed to make decisions on the spot or does he have to wait? So this semi-adaptivity suggests that the adversary has to wait. Um, without going into further details, it's something that you would like to get rid of. Even though it's quite standard in cryptographic and security protocol design, exactly because it's sometimes, quite frequently, an easier goal to achieve. Uh, we took care of this adaptive security um, in our next version of the protocol called Roboros Prowls, which appeared in Eurocrypt 2018. This is another cryptography conference that came after crypto. Um, and there also we improved on the performance of the beacon. And finally, the new version of the protocol, which we uh, just released publicly uh, as a technical report uh, just a bit over a month ago, uh, called Roboros Genesis, uh, entertains a, a feature that enables parties to bootstrap from Genesis, thus addressing this issue of dynamic availability, which I mentioned before. So let's understand very, very briefly the protocol. Maybe some of you have seen already uh, presentations or descriptions of the protocol um, or read the paper. I'll very briefly go over what the protocol does, just to refresh your memory. So the, as I mentioned already, the protocol was designed together with the with a proof that demonstrates its robust transaction ledger. And the proof strategy involves properties of the underlying blockchain data structure. So these are uh, properties that we have established in prior work that was focusing on the Bitcoin blockchain, common prefix, chain quality, and chain growth. The honest parties are paired with an adversary who tries to subvert the protocol. And there are certain uh, privileges that the adversary enjoys, such as network dominance, completely can schedule messages, can deliver the messages any way it wants, you can act after all the honest parties act, and so forth. So uh, when you approach a protocol like Ouroboros, uh, it's helpful to think about it designed in three stages. This is actually the approach that we also uh, did in the first paper and we followed uh, henceforth. So in stage one, um, what we try to solve is a very small snapshot of the whole system execution. Uh, in that snapshot, you can assume that stake of the participant is fixed. So, so what you ask is the following. Let me fix the stake of all participants. And I'm asking the question, is it possible to generate an opportunity for the blockchain to advance by a little bit so that the basic properties of the blockchain can be satisfied? And these are common prefix, chain quality, chain growth. So, in other words, there's going to be a large common prefix uh, in the chain that all the participants have. Their chain will grow and it will contain some honest blocks. That's the chain quality aspect. So, once we have this, the key step is to show that if the small single snapshot works and the blockchain can be extended by a little bit, then what we do is we show that if there was a random beacon that emitted a publicly verifiable and available random string, then it would be possible to bootstrap this protocol and then do another segment. This could be something like sequentially repeating the same, the same process with the randomness refreshing the participant schedule. So this is the stage two of the protocol using an imaginary random beacon. And then at stage three of the protocol, you show how the protocol can actually take some additional steps. The protocol participants can take some additional steps and simulate that random beacon themselves. So thus, you do not have to have anything external. And the protocol itself can proceed with just the randomness coming from the Genesis block. So here is a small schematic representation. In the static stake segment, what happens is that time is divided in slots or sm small time units. Some of these slots um, are empty, like the one you see here at position four. In the other uh, cases, you have a slot where a certain stakeholder is elected and 
is in a verifiable manner eligible to issue a block. Now the randomness that elects that stakeholder comes from the seed randomness which in this static setting you can just assume uh, that it's built in the genesis block. So wh what happens oops, is that this stakeholder is elected, issues a block, this block contains a set of transactions, it is signed, and it's signed in a way that this particular stakeholder, let's call him L2, uh, can convince anyone else that this is uh, properly constructed. Now this block contains a link to the Genesis block in this way forming a hash chain. Now this continues in this way with some slots missed and some other slots being silent because no stakeholder is elected. It's also possible that some slots may have multiple stakeholders issuing a block. The protocol should have a way for resolving these issues. So what you see is a first stage which produces uh, what I showed in the previous slide and then there is a beacon which seeds again uh, the random string that you have here. Now what happens now is that the stakeholder distribution that you had on originally which was built in the genesis block is being drawn now from the blockchain itself and reinitializes re the protocol. Now the key trick here is that the whole process repeats. Now this structure is also fundamental in arguing that the protocol is secure. So uh, using this, if you want, recursive structure uh, was one of the ideas that helped present a proof argument that the protocol works. So now the same thing is going to process towards the third stage. This, the beacon then again appears, randomness, uh, a randomness string is added here and the stakeholder distribution is drawn taking into account all transactions that have taken place uh, at this period. So these large periods are called epochs um, and uh, they are the basic, let's say, building blocks in the execution sequence of the protocol. Finally, using some cryptographic technique, the beacon has to be implemented and essentially the protocol participants themselves will have to uh, produce that value as the protocol advances. So uh, this is the high level overview of how the protocol uh, how Roboros works. Now what I haven't told you is how the parties resolve disagreements between them. So in other words, when they see two alternative hash chains, how do they pick one? Um, so uh, the rule that uh, Uroboros Genesis follows is the following. It has two types of comparisons. The first comparison is a short range comparison. If the change that uh, a protocol participant considers they diverge uh, just a little bit up to k blocks where k is a parameter, they just follow the longest chain. Nevertheless, for long range comparisons, they don't follow a longest chain approach and rather use a plenitude approach to pick the right chain. So I'll explain a little bit what is this plenitude approach that we uh, have in Ouroboros Genesis. So what happens is that when a participant considers two chains that are diverged and they diverge quite deeply then it considers their forking point and then focuses on a certain region which is um, after the split. So the party is going to follow the chain that has the bigger density of blocks over the time domain. So the intuition behind this is that this density of blocks in the time domain suggests uh, an evidence of higher participation. So this is exactly the idea and what we prove is that blockchains which are produced by the adversary will exhibit a less dense block distribution. And this is why the protocol can be secure despite the fact that 
the parties will have no other advice when they join the protocol beyond the Genesis block. Now, what is uh, particularly exciting about this is that this feature is not present in any of the other POS blockchain protocols um, that either used a trusted checkpoint or moving checkpoint or some other information um, about the participation of stakeholders that engage in the protocol. So that was the crash course on how Ouroboros uh, proof of uh, stake works. So now let me come to some of the uh, important research streams um, that uh, take the Ouroboros protocol and make it suitable for a backbone of a cryptocurrency uh, like Cardano. The first uh, such step is stake pools. So the, an important challenge in POS protocols is that, well, stakeholders themselves, they have to be online and engage in the protocol execution. Oh, well, in some sense, you were expecting that. That was the whole idea from the beginning. The stakeholders of the protocol are the ones that hold the coin, and thus they are the ones that will, will run the protocol. So in some sense, you could say, well, that's not a problem. You know, it was there all along. That was the whole idea. Uh, nevertheless, this is not a good way to approach that. I mean, after all, just because you hold currency or you hold coin in a certain system does not mean that, well, you would like to participate in maintaining its ledger. I mean, yes, you're interested uh, in, in the currency itself since you possess a certain amount of it. This doesn't mean that you have uh, the ability uh, to run a service that is going to participate in this protocol. So, if you look at Bitcoin, you can see that there is a clear decoupling between these two roles. And the decoupling that I'm referring to uh, is the fact that miners and coin holders are not the same set. I mean, clearly miners hold some coin. I mean, after all, they are participating in mining because they do earn Bitcoin. So they, they do earn, uh, uh, they are sort of um, coin holders. Um, but certainly it's not the other way around. I mean, if you hold Bitcoin, it doesn't mean you do mining. Uh, and uh, you may even hold Bitcoin without participating or even observing the protocol at all. You would even have Bitcoin stored in a cold wallet, a paper wallet, and uh, you'll just not engage in using uh, the currency at all. Um, so, is it possible to address this? I mean, this is a real concern. The problem here is that if this is not addressed, you may run, a situation, you may run into a situation where, well, you have only a small percentage of the stakeholders um, actually being interested in participating in the protocol. Let's say 10%. So then you have another 90% that even though they're interested in holding the currency, they are not effectively participating in the protocol in any meaningful way. Uh, and, and this creates a, a disparity that it would be good if it is addressed. So an idea that's capable of addressing this is this concept of a stake pool. To understand what happens, let's look a little bit more deeply into a decomposition of a, a POS address, like the address that is implemented for Ouroboros, or actually an enhanced version of it, which will be implemented soon. So what you see here is a, an address that features a payment verification key and a staking verification key. What's important to observe here is a duality of the keys that are found in an address. Now, this is unique to a POS protocol. Um, your balance in a POS protocol has a dual functionality. It's the coins that you would like to spend, but it's also the stake you have for participating in the protocol. So, of course, 
cryptographically speaking, it's possible like to use the same key for both of these operations. But this has a fundamental um, has some fundamental disadvantages. The most important disadvantage is that the key that you use for staking or the key that you use to participate in the protocol needs in one way or another be a hot key, so to speak. So it can't be something that, let's say, you can leave it like in a cold wallet without having it connect to the internet. Uh, and perhaps for some people that's not an issue. After all, like, you know, some people may not even have a key. Uh, they may have all their uh, money or their, or their coins in an exchange address. So thus they don't, they don't have the issue of like maintaining a, managing a key. Uh, but for others is, is a real issue. So a way to address this is have two independent keys. One key is for payments, or the other key is for staking. So this creates an address that has this like double structure. There is a hash of the payment key and a hash of the staking key. Um, now, the staking itself, we don't call it a key, but it's rather a staking object. Uh, because what we want to achieve is to have a, um, three different um, features for that key. One, what we call the base address, is uh, a standard address where it has an independent payment key and an independent, independent staking key. But another type of address we call a pointer address. So a pointer address is an address that does not have an independent staking key. Instead, it points and thus inherits its staking key from another address. And finally, we have another, another address that we call an enterprise address, which doesn't have a staking key at all. So basically, this enables someone to withdraw themselves from staking altogether. Because, for instance, they may be not uh, eligible to do that because of their own reasons. For example, they're not allowed to profit from the stake they have. Um, so, staking keys allow for participation in POS, but we can use them for more things. And this is what we do for stake pools. So, a staking key can create a pool creation certificate. So such certificate can be signed by multiple keys and will be attached in the blockchain. And delegating the stake associated with the staking key to a pool is another operation that we can do with the staking key. So these are the three main operations that we will derive from staking keys. Participating in the protocol, creating a pool, and delegating to a particular pool. So let's look a little bit about the, uh, using these addresses. Let's look at the wallet footprints that, that you expect to see in the blockchain once you are in this operation. Um, so on the upper right, you can see this case of an enterprise address, which I mentioned. So enterprise addresses do not have uh, staking at all. So they do not participate in staking. They are not capable of, uh, of uh, participating uh, in the staking process. In the lower right, what you have is a wallet that only creates base addresses. So base addresses have an independent staking key. Um, there is a good advantage in having base addresses, which is mainly privacy. So uh, every address, two addresses coming from the same wallet will be indistinguishable to addresses that come from a, another wallet. Or so in this way, uh, you can have a higher degree of privacy. Um, nevertheless, there's going to be one particular disadvantage. Staking from such a wallet will require more effort on the side of the user and its wallet. And finally, uh, the sort of normal mode of operation is the one you see there. There's a base address and a number of pointer addresses. So pointer addresses, they just point to the staking key of the base address, and thus using the staking key uh, requires only to use uh, the single address uh, staking key. So here is an example of creating a stake pool. So a stake pool is... Uh, for those of you that are familiar, let's say, with digital signatures, uh, you can think of it as a uh, top-level certification authority, like a certificate authority um, signing key, so a self-signed certificate, if you want. Um, it's not exactly that, but you can think about it like that. A, a stake pool um, creation certificate is uh, essentially naming the pool, uh, determining its... Uh, uh, basic features, perhaps some information about the pool, 
and some details about how the pool manages its stake pool members, which I'll cover in a moment. And uh, it is signed by a number of staking keys. Now, the staking keys that sign it may come from a base address, which has a bunch of pointer addresses, or may come from base addresses like that, that have no pointer address associated with them. Whenever you have a base address, you have some uh, stake associated with it. For example, in this case, you have one ADA here, one ADA, two ADA. And here, when you have pointer addresses, you also have some ADA associated with them. The amount of stake that stands behind a stake pool creation certificate is the sum of all that. So in this particular case, uh, it would be 7 ADA. So here you have a stake pool creation certificate that is backed up by a certain amount of ADA, which is 7, which is as many as these addresses are provided here. So when you're joining a stake pool, on the other hand, you do the following. The stake pool creation certificate, there on the upper right, just the red part, is on the blockchain. And now you see that, and you say, OK, I would like to delegate my stake to that stake pool. So what I do now is a similar process as before. I'm using my staking key to sign a delegation certificate that reference, references that stake pool creation certificate. So uh, what you see here is, for example, a base address and three associated pointer addresses, which are in total backed up by four ADA, creating a delegation certificate that refers to that stake pool. Then you have a delegation certificate uh, that's issued by the base address on the lower right. And then all that go to the stake pool on top right. Stake pool initially was backed up by seven ADA, but now it has 13 ADA because it has two pool members, those that you see there. So what happens now is effectively the following. You have a set of entities that created a pool, let's say, backing it up with 20 ADA. They collected some delegates that assigned their stake to the pool, enhancing the uh, stake pool into 90 ADA. And then that stake pool, in particular the people associated with the pool here, will be responsible for running a full node uh, in the Roboros uh, blockchain protocol. And they will participate, but they will participate effectively like having 90 ADA. And that's going to work in the following manner. Whenever one of those stakeholders is elected to participate in the protocol, that entity is going to act on its behalf by directly referring to that sequence of certificates that exist in the blockchain. Again, pointing back to the blockchain, to the particular location where you have the stake creation certificate and the delegation certificate uh, to, that, to that pool. So what are main challenges? So here's, that was the delegation mechanism. How do you create stake pools? Um, so there are two uh, very basic challenges here. So first of all, a main challenge is that uh, the stakeholders may aggregate to a single or a few pools. There's an obvious disadvantage here that the system becomes decentralized. So it is therefore quite important to think how is it possible to prevent that. Another problem is uh, civil attacks. So this, this class of attacks are uh, well known in uh, cybersecurity, and they refer to a situation where you have a single actor creating multiple identities. They appear in the eyes of the system and other participants as multiple different identities, but in reality it's just a single actor. Um, in this particular case, in this particular instance of civil attack, uh, you would have a single actor creating multiple pools, perhaps with different websites, etc., etc., but they're all controlled by the you know, same entity. I mean, in both cases, uh, the problem is that the system becomes um, centralized. And perhaps in the second one, it's even worse, because at least in the first one, the system becomes centralized and it looks centralized also. Okay? In the second one, it's even worse. It's centralized, but it doesn't even look like centralized. So it may look sort of deceivingly distributed. Um, which brings me to incentives. So how is it possible to address these issues? Now, these issues, uh, they have to do with the way that participants engage with the protocol. 
Um, so they are not pure cryptographic in manner, in, 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 uh, in a sense, but they're also game theoretic. So let's review the basic stake pool tasks. So wh what is a stake pool is supposed to do? It has to be online to carry out the basic protocol operations. It has to um, check if the stake uh, pool member is elected in a slot and issue a block on their behalf. They also have to collect and relay transactions to other nodes. So there are certain uh, um, you know, tasks that have to be carried out by, by stake pool. And uh, essentially both of them do require uh, running, an on, running a full node in a server uh, that is guaranteed to have a good uptime and connectivity with the network. However, furthermore, it should like collect transactions, relay them, and so forth, and, and check the progress of the protocol. So, um, what we want is to design a reward scheme that will incentivize the parties to follow the protocol. In this particular case, the parties that we are interested in are all the stakeholders, some of them becoming stake pool leaders, and some of them becoming their delegates. So, de designing a mechanism here refers to a situation where, as the protocol advances, there are certain events that are happening in the ledger itself that trigger a certain reward to be given to one or more of the participants. So, for instance, um, looking at the Bitcoin blockchain, there is a re reward scheme in place that rewards the miner that issues a new block with some new Bitcoin and transaction fees, which are collected from the, uh, from the current block. Now, understanding uh, why this mechanism is there is, is a very fundamental question. So, this mechanism is there to create the right set of incentives for the participants to run the protocol. Um, there is a long-running debate about whether that mechanism that is in Bitcoin um, is, is a good mechanism. From a theoretical point of view, there are extreme deficiencies. Uh, one important one, highlighted by this class of attacks uh, called selfish mining attacks, suggests that this mechanism cannot be in equilibrium because it makes sense when all the other participants are following this mechanism that you, your mining pool, if you want, does something slightly different, for example, withholds a block, and that will create an opportunity for you, at least in the short term, to gain more than other uh, pools. Actually, this can also be generalized and seen also in the longer term. Now, while um, this is not happening um, as it is right now, or at least is not happening in a way that uh, we can detect, um, the question remains. We do need a better understanding of the incentive mechanisms behind these protocols. And we cannot use uh, with, with any relative certainty the reward mechanism that is in Bitcoin. So the desired feature of a reward scheme is that parties' payoffs from the mechanism should be such that they should not want to deviate from the protocol. Assuming, of course, they are rational, and we have to accept a certain model of rationality here in order to be able even to articulate such an argument. So, Furthermore, the way the reward scheme works, and that's like an additional, a very important consideration, should promote certain cons configurations and should exclude others. So, for example, a configuration where all the pools um, just become centralized into a single one is better if it is avoided. So how do we design a mechanism that is capable of doing that? So we have to give rewards. Any reward scheme should have a starting point. There have to be rewards that will be distributed to the participants. And this is also, I should say, the approach that we've taken. There is also a type of negative approach that you can take to that because, uh, uh, well, Rewards are, what are they after all? They are negative penalties. So an alternative approach is just penalized. Uh, and this is an approach, for example, that uh, uh, has also been explored. 
uh, in the general space of designing these um, mechanisms. Um, for instance, the slashing conditions in the Casper protocol is a type of penalty. Uh, but here we're interested in rewards. So, where we're going to take these rewards? Where transaction fees is uh, a standard source and funds drawn from some reserve. Now, as you know, there is an ADA reserve which has one of the roles to play in this incentivization process. So, some funds drawn from the ADA reserve will be used to reward the participants that are running the protocol. So the reward scheme then will have the job to split the reward pool in a suitable manner and create the stakeholders. So the reward scheme we are going to employ in Roboros, something that's consistent with uh, uh, the observations that were uh, in the original paper, in the crypto paper, is epoch-based. So instead of taking the approach to issue rewards in every block, Instead, what happens is the following. As you remember from the high-level description, what happens is the protocol advances in epochs. A few blocks are created, then random is generated, you reseed the random string of the epoch and you advance. At that moment, you stand, you see what happens, and you say, okay, for that period, there are certain rewards that have to be distributed. And the reward scheme will take those rewards and, and distribute distribute them in a proper way. Uh, given that in the Cardano implementation a slot lasts 20 seconds, an epoch contains 21,600 slots, this is five days, every five days there are going to be rewards. So some of these rewards will come from transaction fees. So here's a reminder of how transaction fees are uh, determined in uh, uh, Cardano. So the minimal fees, the, you have this linear formula where A and B are constants, um, and the size is the transaction of the transaction size in bytes. Um, so essentially what you have is this linear formula that you have to pay more with the size of each transaction. So here's a worked out example. Now what's important here is that both of these features were selected uh, for the following reason. On the one side you have the A component, which basically says that every transaction, no matter how small, has a minimum amount to be paid. And if you want, this is a basic denial of service type of protection. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the more the bigger transaction is, the more you have to pay. And that's the linear component, uh, B times size. At the same time, the other source where you expect to get rewards, or where we're going to draw rewards for the reward scheme, is the ADA reserves. And I mean, as you know, the supply of ADA today, which is circulating, is 31 million. The maximum of supply is 45 million, so there is a billion, I should say. Um, so there are 14 billion on reserve. So the reward scheme is a type of function that, uh, when you look at the end of the epoch, you will see a distribution of all the stake assigned to pools. So imagine now you're looking at the end of an epoch, and what you see is some stake pool creation certificates and some delegation certificates that assign certain stake to an epoch. So a pool that, let's say, is 12% of the total stake can make a claim for a certain amount of rewards that is determined by the reward scheme and is a function among other things, which I will explain in a moment, of the 12%. It will not be 12% of the rewards, and that's important. I will explain why. One first circumstance that it may not be is that the claim for the reward will only be honored um, assuming the pool is operating well. And operating well means that it participates in the protocol. Of course, we cannot be certain about what the pool uh, does not do and is not reflected in the blockchain, but what can be sure about is whether uh, the pool has participated at a certain moment. So, in Ouroboros, from the crypto paper, as it is implemented uh, in Cardano right now, it is possible to know that a certain pool missed a slot that was elected and was supposed to participate. So, this is one reason that uh, you may not honor a specific 
uh, a specific claim to rewards. Now, an important feature of the mechanism itself is this uh, fencing that the mechanism does. What you see here is that the function is a function of 12%, but a pool losing its rewards will not cause other pools to get more. So essentially, if for whatever reason the mechanism deems that that certain pool is not allowed to get this 12%, or that this 12% should be tempered and reduced according to a certain formula, this does not mean that the other participants will, have to get, will be able to get more. And this type of fencing me mechanism is key to argue that selfish mining will not be able to help you improve your position if you are a stake pool. So in other words, if you engage in block withholding, for instance, trying to make sure that uh, certain transactions don't make it in the ledger, potentially giving you an advantage, this will not change your position with respect to rewards. So, let me now come to one of the most critical features of the re reward mechanism. So, a critical feature of the reward mechanism is that we would want to limit uh, the number of pools created to a certain number. Now, this is important for ensuring that the number of pools is, first of all, we would like them to be big enough uh, so that there is sufficient decentralization, but also that they are not that big as to make their purpose uh, new. So, what we want is to set a target number, and that target number is going to be the natural number that the system is going to converge to. So, what we investigate in the reward scheme uh, space, design space, uh, is, is it possible to set up a reward mechanism that's parameterized by a certain parameter k, the desired target number of pools, and then the free rational behavior of the participants is going to converge to that number of pools. Because that number of pools, let's say k is, is 100, is going to give a natural decentralization in the system that is also going to be collective enough for the system to operate fast. So, um, a simple way that you can think of achieving something like that is to temper rewards. What we do is that the amount of rewards that the pool gets will start to decrease if the size of the pool gets larger. We don't want the pool to get more rewards if it gets bigger. So we would like the pool to start gaining rewards if it's small, and if it reaches a certain size, we would like to stop gaining rewards. Now, this mechanism will ensure that if a pool gets too popular, for whatever reason, uh, the participants that engage in the pool, um, the stake pool leader is very good at advertising the pool and so forth, this will not lead to a popularity contest that can make certain pools very large. So a simple way to achieve that is to say that as the pool gets larger, the rewards will start to diminish. And there will be a certain point after which the rewards will stop increasing. So if you are a prospective stakeholder that would like to delegate to a pool, it would not make sense to delegate to that pool because you will get less. Instead, you will try to find a smaller pool and participate in that. So, here is uh, a simple like example where you see stake pools A and B with stake 0.3% and 1.2% respectively. And if you do a cut at 1%, then you would say that if a pool has 1.2%, will just receive rewards as if it had just 1%. So, it will be not rational to delegate to that pool if you see that it has exceeded 1%. Instead, it makes sense to make a new pool. So this policy will prevent stakeholders from growing too large. Another feature of the reward scheme that I already mentioned is penalizing downtime. If slots, if slots are missed, which is something that can be 
detected in the Ouroboros blockchain, uh, there will be penalties in the form of not receiving rewards. And such penalties may last for certain periods. In this way, participants, stakeholders that have delegated to pools that are not operating well, they will be given the opportunity to move their stake to other pools. So these penalties will not affect the rewards of other pools. That's an important feature which I mentioned already, which basically means that you'll not be able to create a situation where a certain penalty will be incurred to another pool just because uh, um, a certain pool um, has missed its own rewards. So let's see now the rewards distribution function. So the reward scheme is meant to operate automatically. The mechanism is not going to operate uh, in a way that stake pool members or stake pool leaders are going to reward themselves stake pool members as for example in the way it happens uh, in uh, Bitcoin mining. Instead, the system itself is going to redistribute rewards according to a predetermined mechanism. So stake pool members will receive rewards uh, automatically by the system in the form of credit to their accounts or active UTXOs. So a pool leader will declare a cost and a profit margin, pool members delegate their stake to the pool, and then the distribution function will split the pool's rewards, taking into account cost, margin, and stake. So ensuring that the, call, the pool leader will cover its costs and will make some profit while guaranteeing at the same time that pool members will receive rewards according to the stake they have committed. So all this calculation will be public and implemented as part of the blockchain itself. So how do we design this mechanism? So I'll show you just an example of some of the experiments that we're running to understand the uh, rational behavior of actors in such a system. So without going into more detail, what we're examining right now is different functions that should exhibit the following behaviors. If the rational actors are left themselves to decide what to do, the whole system should converge to a predetermined number of pools. So all these experiments, they start with a candidate function and a distribution of stake, which is synthetic, uh, created here following a Pareto so-called distribution. And then what we have in the experiment is a simulation of rational actors engaging in the protocol, delegating and creating pools freely, trying to optimize their utility. And what we want to achieve is a behavior like that. So here you see pools that are created, and then they maintain a uh, stake over time. It's one of them roughly at the same level. So here's an example of a rather stable run. And here's an example of a bad run. So this is a bad function, the previous one was a good function. So what makes this function bad is, uh, as you see here, what happens is that multiple pools created. So here's the number of pools. By the way, here's the number of pools. Actually, this hits uh, the maximum, so that basically everyone has a stake pool. Then the system does what it's supposed to do. So the pools are dying and stake pools um, our form which are larger and as the system shows that uh, it's uh, going well and sort of tries to stabilize then it gets destabilized which means that there is certain action of one of the participants that triggers a race again to creating more stake pools so here is an, an, an unstable distribution so what we've done in this game theoretic analysis which uh, will be available soon to see it in its, uh, uh, in its entirety, um, is that we try to see through possible functions and develop a reward, a stake pool reward scheme that has all the right properties that we need. Most importantly, that it gives a stable st uh, distribution of stake pools uh, that every stake pool has about the same amount of stake, none of them is too big or too small. So I don't have the time to tell you more about that and I'll try to wrap up very, very soon. Um, so I just want to say a few things about sidechains.
So side chains in another very important research stream uh, for Roboros. A side chain basically is a mechanism that builds communication channels between blockchains. Here is, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain, and if, you, if the Ethereum was acting as a uh, side chain of Bitcoin, would be a certain event that happening in Bitcoin that creates a possibility to react to that event in the other blockchain. So these are extremely useful. Uh, these are extremely useful um, mechanisms. Sometimes they are called pegging mechanism between blockchains uh, that enable a connection to be made and essentially assets to be transferred uh, from one blockchain to another. So what you want to achieve um, is uh, what you might call the sidechain participation independence, which essentially says that the stakeholders that participate in this uh, sidechain and the stakeholders that participate in the other sidechain are not the same set. If they are exactly the same set, you understand that's not a it's it's a trivial problem. Essentially, you have two blockchains which are maintained by the same set of parties. It's a trivial to facilitate uh, transfers of assets between the two, or at least it's just an engineering question. Uh, but it becomes like a very difficult question uh, when the set of uh, stakeholders are not the same. So a particular instance of what you might call a first generation side chains is the star structure one, where basically you have a main chain and then you have side chains which are associated with the main chain. The assumption here of the star structure is that all stakeholders follow the main chain, but arbitrary success of them follow a side chain. So a star structure uh, side chain system, if you want to call it like that, it's, uh, it's easier, it's an easier instance of the problem to solve. And, and this is what we are addressing right now as a generation, first generation side chain system for Ouroboros and Cardano. So, Essentially, just to cast it in the, from the Cardano perspective, main chain will be the settlement layer, and then you have multiple side chains which provide enhanced operation. For example, the computational layer is one of them, but you can think of many different ones. Very importantly also, you, don't have, you may not have a single computational layer, and we won't have a single computational layer. There will be multiple ones that can coexist, and then you can choose to transfer your assets from different side chains that want to be run computational layers. So the first one, the testnet uh, for the K-framework-based Ethereum virtual machine was launched just recently, to, almost two weeks ago. And then we have Yele, which is a register-based virtual machine, as opposed to stack-based one, as in the case of the Ethereum virtual machine, and Plutus, which is a functional programming language-based. So side chains in Roboros rely on a cryptographic primitive called Threshold Multisignature, which is one of the cryptographic primitives that we develop specifically for supporting sidechains. And essentially, and what's the key operation of this primitive, is that they allow stakeholders of a sidechain to succinctly signal to the main chain maintainers the status of a sidechain. The, the key point here is succinctly. What we want, basically, is that the footprint of a sidechain to be as small as possible in the main chain. So, by having this primitive, we can allowing coming and outgoing transactions to facilitate across sidechains. So this brings me to the end of the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is, can you give us some intuition behind why the majority chain should always be the denser uh, chain? And the second one is, uh, in the end, is there any way to address the Sybil attacks? Yeah, great questions. Uh, great questions, both of them. So, um, so some intuition about the, uh, the density rule. Um, so, um, participation in uh, Ouroboros is based on electing based on stake. So, Imagine that you have a urn or a box with red and blue balls. Um, so if the, let's say, blue balls are just bigger in number, let's say 51 versus 49, what you hope and expect is that drawing from this box over a long period of time will, will show um, sort of a bigger number of color blue in, in the balls you've drawn, right? So this is a crude, you know, this is just a crude example. 
um, but just like a, it's a starting point uh, to think about this. So somehow we hope that this argument will extend to the time domain as we experience the blockchain as it is being advanced as it is advancing that somehow the participants that are elected to issue blocks in the main chain or if you want the chain that most parties follow will be more frequent now this is not going to be true for um, sort of all segments of that chain so for instance it might be a possible attack that is still feasible it's not going to be an attack per se against the Ouroboros Genesis but a possible attack here is the one that says um, I can mine some initial blocks on my own this might be sparse and then certain good event happens and then let's say I'm elected all the time then it's going to be very very dense so I'm going to be elected all the time thus all blocks will be with me but still there will be this initial sequence that the chain is going to be sparse um, so that's the main intuition here so the main intuition is that the adversary which is like the 49 percent let's say adversary um, is um, operating at some disadvantage is still not elected uh, sufficiently enough over any particular period of time so there will be a certain point that he will be that his chain is going to be more sparse and we could use that to distinguish so that's an intuition here of of, of what's happening in the in the case between um, two blockchains one produced by the adversary let's say and another by the honest parties um, okay so now next uh, the next part of the question was what do we do about civil attacks indeed what i showed you here um, is nothing in the i pose the problem of civil attacks but I didn't tell you how we address it um, it is it is very important actually um, that, that this is addressed and the mechanism that I showed you ensures that a stake pool will not become too large but in the slides nothing prevented someone to do the following a create a pool and then another pool and then another pool and then another pool Perhaps all of them can become large and you may end up in a situation where you have, let's say, this target number of pools all produced by a single entity. So what we're going to do to address this is to provide a small, slight, but still non-negligible advantage to stakeholders that start a pool with substantial stake. So for example, if I am a stake pool leader that I start with one ADA and you are, let's say, a group of stake pool of stakeholders that start a pool with 10 ADA, this is gonna have a positive payoff for your pool. So it will, even though I will be able, if I have 10 ADA to create 10 pools, I will end up with less money compared to the case that I would have 10 different pools with one ADA each. Is that, is that clear as a, as a concept? So, so this is something that our mechanism takes into account. So that's why, going back to um, uh, this uh, slide, so, so that's why this uh, stake pool creation certificate which is backed up by 7 ADA is important. It's not just important the 13 ADA, but 7 ADA uh, that started the pool from is important because I repeat, this is something that the mechanism is going to be sensitive on. So, if instead these, um, let's say, two persons here that control um, well, actually, the stake pool was created in the previous slide. These are just the delegates. So here is the pool that was that has seven ADA, and you have one guy here that has four ADA, and let's say two others that have one and two. If they instead created seven stake pools with one ADA each, these seven stake pools will effectively give them less than this one. 
So this is the mechanism that, uh, this is the way that we're going to incentivize people not to do civil, um, not to engage in civil attacks. I have to say that this is only an incentive driven mechanism. So, in other words, it's, it's only going to be based on the rationality of the participants. There's not going to be a fundamental prevention of, um, of, of civil attacks. I mean, after all, this, if the system is truly decentralized, civils might exist. What we can do and what we will do is to de-incentivize civils, which is uh, in the same spirit that you would find in other cases where you have a decentralized system that tries to address civil attacks. For example, as in the case of DOS protection. So you create some mechanism to make it expensive for the adversary to engage into civil behavior. Uh, and this is exactly what also uh, we will do here. Okay. Yes, more, more questions. Yeah, perhaps up there. Uh, in the context of uh, exchanges, uh, to me it sounds like they will be somehow put in an advantageous position because they would have a substantial amount of ADA stored. Yes. And also, they might even be able to break the plenitude rule uh, with respect to the length of their fork of the chain. So uh, even though the rewards are uniformly split across all pools, right? One over K, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, aren't they going to be able to rewrite history essentially and this way kind of channel more funds into their pockets? Okay, so the question is, is about uh, exchanges and, and how do we deal with them in the, in the reward mechanism. So, um, so I should tell you that this is something that we lost a lot of sleep on. I mean, this is one of the, uh, it's like a major concern uh, in, in general we have. I mean, exchanges happen to be special participants in the system. They are participants who themselves are representatives of, of other participants. So in some sense, they are like stake pools, but they're not exactly stake pools because they may not actually necessarily engage uh, in, in, uh, in running the protocol at all. I mean, in principle, actually, they may just not, not, operate, uh, not operate in this manner uh, in any way. Um, so one approach that we will offer to exchanges is that they do not participate in staking at all. So essentially they just give up the right to staking. So that's why you will see in the mechanism we do have these enterprise addresses. So it's going to be feasible for an exchange to say I'm an exchange so all my all the funds I have you know they're essentially not mine I'm not an actual stakeholder but I represent some stakeholders so I can opt for, a, for an enterprise address and that address will not participate in staking. Um, but I should say, I mean, this is not something that uh, is feasible even to enforce, but it's an option. So, so approach A for an exchange uh, is, is doing an enterprise address. Um, so whether also this is going to be a preferred mode, uh, this is also, I think, to a large degree, is also a community decision. I mean, what would be the best way of, of handling this? Um, so, um, but that is definitely an option that we have considered uh, and it's going to be feasible in the system. Uh, whether there is going to be, at this moment, these enterprise addresses do not have any additional capability, at least in the first generation of the system, um, but what we intend is to facilitate some advantages for enterprise addresses in the long run. So enterprise addresses may have certain advantages over other addresses uh, in terms of how do they move funds, let's say, from one address to, to the other, um, and that would potentially make them more attractive to exchanges. Um, but this is not something that is going to be released, at least at the onset. Um, so, otherwise, as the situation is, exchanges will be like everyone else that has a lot of stake. So, it's going to be essentially an actor that can set up a stake pool um, and uh, if, they, if they want, and they can even use that stake pool to advertise uh, and engage with potential customers. 
And clearly, because of the mechanism that there is going to um, sort of uh, cut the um, rewards up to a certain level, let's say 1%, if you have an exchange that has 5%, you can set up five stake pools. And that's fine. There's nothing, there's nothing bad about this in the sense that, well, you have a 5% stakeholder. So uh, it's natural if we cut at 1%, that there's going to be five different stake pools controlled by the same 5% stakeholder, and that's what might happen. So I, I envision these two possible scenarios for exchanges, either following an enterprise address and not participating at all, or having a 5% stake and we'll split it into five stake uh, pools. But, but other than that, they will, not have any, they will not have any other way of gaming the system. Um, at least there will be nothing in the system to give them a better advantage uh, on gaming the system. Yes, please. What about the weights? Because uh, the random selection is actually based on a distribution of stake. So that was going to be actually my next question. Why isn't the random function uh, drawing uniform samples rather than weighted by the size of the stake? Because uh, th th that's what I meant before with uh, potentially breaking the plenitude rule. The pools will have more either, therefore the probability of uh, being drawn as uh, block uh, proposers will be larger. Yeah, but that's, that, that's already taken care of. So basically the whole analysis we do operates as long as no single stakeholder is over 49 percent. Oh, I mean over 50 percent. But I mean, in other words, yeah, that's an issue, but, but it's, not an, it's not a real issue as long as the no exchange reaches that, 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 that height. So just to take the point a bit further, because the question is, why does an exchange doesn't impose an, a security issue in, in our whole analysis is that we, will, we are choosing our security parameters so, um, you know, so carefully and so um, pessimistically, if you want, uh, to address those issues, exactly because we want to address those issues. I mean, so there is a reason the epoch is five days, for instance. I mean, this comes from certain calculations that say certain bad events should not happen. I mean, well, we would have preferred that it's not five days, for example. We, we have preferred, let's say, it was one day or, or half a day. So that the system can actually, you know, evolve faster or, you know, somehow catch up faster with its uh, stakeholder distribution that they, it uses as a reference point. But it doesn't exactly because to address issues like that. We would like big stakeholders, not 5%, but even up to 49%, to not be able to um, create a security uh, problem. Thank you. An another question? Uh, yes, uh, please. Yeah, or just. Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess the gentleman on top. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was, it was great. Um, I'm interested in the, in the reward part of it. Um, you said you have 45 billion uh, aid is available, and then 31 are allocated, right? then you have a fixed reward per slot. A fixed reward per, it's not fixed, it's not but, fixed. but it's basically per epoch. First of all, it's not, it's not per slot, so it's kind of a bigger period of time, but probably this doesn't change your question. No, but uh, how long does that reward, that treasury last? Oh, how long it will last? Um, uh, okay, um, so, what I anticipate uh, in what we're going to roll out as the reward scheme, as the final details are not yet completely fixed, but what I anticipate right now is something like that. So the reserves are going to fund uh, the pool, the, re the reward pool for every epoch. The reward pool for every epoch, as I mentioned, is going to come from the stake, from the transactions in terms of fees and from the ADA reserve. And there's going to be some moving from the reserve every epoch. And the anticipation is that over time, let's say following a little bit the way Bitcoin works, is going to be diminishing. So it's going to be less coming from the reserves and more relying on transactions. So the exact details of this are still we're still investigating the right function for that. Uh, and there's certainly, um, you know, interesting issues that are happening there with, with, with what is the exact way of doing that. 
uh, but, but that's what I anticipate is going to happen now. So, so in other words, I'm not sure there is a clear answer to how long it will last. It can last for a long time, but its contribution to protocol execution w will be diminishing over time. Is that uh, reasonable? That's a, that answers yeah. my, my question. And my second question is, um, you said that the pass-through um, between the stake pool and the actual stakeholder um, is fixed by the protocol. Wouldn't it be better if it was variable so that can each stake pool can compete with each other? Yes, so there is a certain amount of um, room, let's say, for competition. Every stake pool declares its operational cost and declares a profit margin. So in other words, there is already a certain amount uh, of, of competition. Nevertheless, at least for this first generation of how the system is going to behave in an incentive-driven decentralized form, is going to be rather restricted. So while innovation in some sense is a, something that we would really interested to see, at the same time, there is an understanding that we would like to have a full and a game theoretic analysis of how the system is going to evolve and we would like to ensure that the system is going to roll out with, with the right sort of amount of guidance so that it's going to reach a proper decentralized setting. So whereas we entertain a lot the idea of um, sort of relying on potentially innovative ideas, let's say, of stake pool uh, distribution functions that the community can, can come up. Uh, at the same time, we would like to make sure that the system is going to stabilize to something which is, which is decentralized. And um, in some sense, reaching that decentralized point is the most important task right now. And after that, there will be mechanisms that the system can evolve into something which is more free and the community can actually drive the system there. So there will be a point, after all, that we will not be the only the ones developing the system. So once we have side chains in place and the system for creating side chains, <coughs> then you can have side chains that follow very different uh, reward structures. So, so the way I view this is that at least this first generation of side chains plus decentralization is going to give a guaranteed as much as possible within a certain model of rationality decentralization profile and after that the system may evolve further uh, because of innovations of the community at least this is how I've, uh, I view this yes um, have you calculated how much inflation it would be during let's say a first stage inflation because of the ADA reserves uh, inflation because of the ADA reserves no, because this is something, this is just one of the many considerations we have. So, but, but certainly the minimum, let's say here, is that stake pool leaders cover their costs and get something. But this is not a scheme for necessarily making stake pool leaders and their members rich. It's more about making sure the system becomes decentralized from that community that, that supports it. So. I mean, I would rather aim for less than, than more with the intention of having more for later and ensuring that the system can go on in the long run and also potentially use the IDA reserves for other things. So for example, the treasury system, which is an important uh, other research stream which I haven't covered. This is another, um, this is another uh, possibility for directing a certain amount of IDA reserves. So in short, the treasury system is going to enable uh, stakeholders of the system to propose ways that the system can evolve. For example, a new sidechain that does X, Y, Z. Um, and then the community can vote whether they would like that particular sidechain to exist, to, to be created. Uh, and and uh, there is a possibility that such, um, that funding can actually, uh, for, for such for example, new side chains could, could be drawn also from the reserves. So that, that would be another way for helping the system to evolve. So, so I would rather hold also for that um, rather than spending too much of the reserves at, at this initial stage. Um, yeah, there's anyone there, yes. Hi. Um, 
My question is um, slightly broader than today's presentation. Um, you have referenced, uh, obviously, other projects like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum's Casper. So, obviously, in your development, you've not just kind of um, been um, uh, not looked at what else uh, is happening outside. Um, I'm curious, given the history of sort of Dan uh, and Charles, and the recent um, sort of mainnet stuff with AOS, what is the thinking between, um, I suppose, internally IOHK slash Cardano, um, in, res um, in respect to, I suppose, other projects? Because I feel like uh, with the Gauss um, project, which was released recently, I feel like um, there's an intention to try and prove that Cardano is not vaporware, which I, I, I don't know, uh, it feels um, a bit like there's a sense of um, uh, insecurity because you know of this slower but sure um, approach that you've taken. So I'm just curious in terms of what the internal thinking behind that is, mm -hmm. if that makes a sense. If that makes sense as a question. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll try to say some words. You know, f following <laughs> hopefully uh, you know in the in the direction of your question. Um, so, so first of all, yes, of course. Like we are, we are reading and studying uh, uh, other uh, everything that other projects do to the, to the degree that's feasible. There's a lot of interesting and amazing stuff that happen in the wider blockchain community. We're also trying to share uh, our things, and I think w the way we share, um, also, I should say, and I pride myself and LSK research team on that, is that we try to share what our work in in a very clear, succinct manner. We present our results in the context of the wider body of knowledge in distributed systems and cryptography. We try to draw parallels and always, to the best of our knowledge, give due credit uh, when, when credit is due. Um, so, um, from my point of view, I'm working in cryptography since the 90s. Uh, and I've seen like the area grown and change over time, become also more popular. And, and of course, I'm delighted to be able to, for example, sit here in front of you this day today. Uh, and, and be able to share some, some of the basic research uh, that in one way or another uh, were in my head for many years and now they become important components in large-scale projects that people care more and more. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity and it's a great opportunity that, that we should celebrate uh, uh, as a community. And when I say there's not the Cardano community or a community that follows specifically what IHK does, but the wider blockchain and distributed ledgers community. Um, so um, what I hope about other, other projects is that they also follow elements of our approach uh, in the sense that they share the results in an organized manner and in a way that we can compare uh, and we, we can make this space better, more resilient to criticism uh, and uh, if you want, in some sense, providing a really robust infrastructure that can be taken seriously by all the remaining, let's say, of the world that we would like to change. I mean, in some sense, it's too, um, if you want, naive to say that we will be able to change so much by doing so little. I mean, Bitcoin is an amazing idea, but it's not enough. It is not enough. Cryptography in the 70s had an amazing idea, key exchange. It's a beautiful idea. It's a powerful idea. It's something that it really came out of nowhere. It was possible using a key exchange pro protocol. It became possible the following completely counterintuitive thing. Right now, in this room, me and you, just the two of us, can develop a language speaking in English without having ever met before that we will start speaking in English to each other and then after a few sentences go back and forth nobody in the room is going to be able to understand what we say but we will we the two of us me and you will have our own language and we can set up this language right now right here without ever meeting before that's an amazing idea. Just think about it. It sounds, first of all, impossible. When Ralph Merkel, in the early 70s, went to his professor at Berkeley and told him this idea to work on it for his uh, semester project, 
he told him, his professor told him, that's not a good idea. It sounds completely out and you should not pursue it. And he pursued it. He pursued it. He pursued this idea and himself and other pioneers of the time, Whit Diffie, Martin Helbon, have actually managed to produce a protocol that does this, this counterintuitive thing. So that was an amazing idea. But did it change the world at that time? No, not at all. Years had to pass. Very substantial research had to be done before actually we would reach today that you could just you know, open your browser, connect to Facebook, and don't care that your uh, news feed and your postings go through tens of computers along the way. And you can be sure that these intermediate computers will not be able to listen to what you type. So, so what I'm saying, remarkable ideas uh, are important. They are the ones that create a paradigm shift in some sense. There is going to be the world, there was the world before key exchange existed, before public key cryptography and after public key cryptography. But this is, was not enough. A lot of people, many of them academics working in cryptography, but not only communities that felt that cryptography is important, engineers that put very substantial effort to implement that. It was a whole number of people that worked together and figured it out. In the 80s, there was one protocol, one key exchange protocol produced after another. There were many key exchange protocols because even though the idea was great, <coughs> implementing it was not so simple. So you had to take very many different things into account. For example, like certificates. It was very complicated. So how do you authenticate the two parties? There were many, many issues. And there was one protocol after another. And one of them was broken, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, we came up with a formal model of what is a key exchange. And right now, just like a few years ago, we had the first formal proof that the implementation of TLS, as the protocol is called today, is actually secure. So the implementation as we use it. So this took decades. Hopefully it won't take decades now. I mean, we have the tools, we have the understanding. But also a distributed ledger, a, a, a robust transaction ledger, is a far more complicated object compared to a, a key exchange protocol. It's not just Alice and Bob that want to send two messages to each other. It's, it's a far more complicated protocol. So we have to put, invest that effort. And that effort will not come you know, from any individual or, or any single actor. Uh, so, so it will have to have from the community as a whole. But also, it should come with a realization that we should get organized. And we should get organized and, and be serious in, in all the things we do, and also in the way that we disseminate information. So it's not about, you know, going back to the question like, um, you know, who did it right or who did it... Uh, it's, it's about like sharing ideas, organizing information, and advancing all together in a scientific fashion uh, this wider area of distributed ledgers. Yeah, uh, state pool creation. Uh -huh. So it was it was a gentleman up there, but maybe let's make two questions. Come on, yeah, two questions. Yeah, two, two short say, questions from here. And does it lock it then the ADA if you create it or uh, so, sorry, state pool creation? Does it lock yes. your ADA? It does. If if it's lock your ADA, and well, no, it doesn't lock your ADA. Ne nevertheless, you should maintain. So in other words, you can still move your ADA around. Nevertheless, if the ADA the state pool creation certificate, you can think about this as a commitment that you have some ADA behind the pool. So essentially, if you sell them, like, and you don't have them anymore, um, then your stake pool will then appear to have less ADA backing it up, and that will have an impact in its, right. in its the, rewards. Yeah, the rewards will be lower. So it, it, will, it will be slightly lower, because, because this goes back to the civil, the civil attack prevention, right? There's no way to distinguish between, let's say, a legitimate stake pool leader that sells off his ADA and someone that engages in a civil attack creates a stake pool and then another and then another. So, so we're going to, because we cannot distinguish between these two behaviors, we have to, we have to do some restriction there. So you won't lock your ADA, but you know, if you can't keep it, then you will lose some money. And it's the gentleman over there. Last question, yeah. 
Uh, could you maybe say a few words about the ongoing research uh, in the direction of quantum resistance? I know it's not an imminent threat necessarily, but uh, I know that there's some stuff going on too. No, no, we were, we're thinking about it a lot actually. Uh, yeah, it's not, not imminent threat, but we, we, we do care about this question a lot. Uh, it's also, you know, certainly in the news. I mean, we don't consider it like an immediate threat, obviously. Uh, but, it, but it's not a threat that to be taken completely lightly, especially uh, for a system uh, like Cardano that we would like, would like to be available for, for many, many years to come. So the first step towards, towards this is to develop a uh, digital signature scheme that uh, is um, post-quantum resilient and is suitable for our purposes. And then the second step is going to integrate that in, in our system in a way that the system becomes post-quantum secure. So the, nice, uh, the good news about this is that at least in, in principle there is nothing <coughs> there is nothing that, that prevents this, um, um, theoretically speaking, there, there's nothing that, that, that prevents us from that. So this is something that's definitely going to happen. Uh, so the only you know, primary concern is um, performance. So uh, w what I anticipate is uh, an initial release of an alternative signature scheme that your wallet can use. That's going to be the post-quantum secure. And then we're going to engage in a type of security analysis that say what's going to happen if you are in this mixed situation where some accounts are postponed secure, some others are not. Um, and uh, eventually uh, what we'd like to show is that if the majority of stake is behind post-quantum accounts, then, then the system is going to be post-quantum secure. So a special analysis should be taken, should be done there. But there is, uh, you know, m many tricky points there from the security analysis point of view because you would like to analyze the system in the presence of a a quantum adversary that might be able to engage with the stakeholders in uh, more complicated ways, let's say, than, than a regular adversary. So this is something that uh, is, ad is advancing and we do have uh, within IHK a research stream uh, exactly for that. Uh, and actually uh, we will uh, be um, releasing more information about this in the, in the near future. Um, so, so basically that was that. And since I'm at this, like there's another I should mention another stream of research, which I haven't had the chance today to talk at all, which is a version of Ouroboros, which uh, uh, is uh, privacy preserving uh, in the sense that, um, for example, Zcash is privacy preserving. Um, and this is like another very, very interesting research direction for us, especially in the POS setting. It's much more difficult to achieve the same effect uh, because there's many more things happening in the blockchain compared to, let's say, a sort of standard Bitcoin-like uh, transaction ledger. So you have like staking operation, delegation, all these operations, they are sort of even more privacy problematic compared to a standard Bitcoin-like ledger. And that's another research thing which I haven't mentioned, but we're also putting a lot of effort uh, uh, these days. Okay, with this, uh, thank you so much for your questions. They were, they were great. Uh,